Today on The Nation Speaks, cancel culture strikes out against all things Russian. We discuss the road we're on and where it could lead with Professor Gary Saul Morrison, an expert in Russian literature and thought, and the author of a new book, Minds Wide Shut. Then in America Q&A, we ask, do you think it's right to cancel or boycott Russians because of the war? Next, one war topic we don't hear much about. How has life changed for ordinary Russians? University of Chicago professor Konstantin Sonin was in Moscow, and he can tell us firsthand. Finally, in our second America Q&A, we ask, should high school seniors have to pass a civics test to graduate? Hello and welcome to The Nation Speaks. I'm your host, Cindy Drucker. The war in Ukraine has definitely captured the West's attention. People are following the news, supporting refugees, debating who's to blame, and trying to see through the fog of war to separate truth from propaganda. One of the more unexpected responses in the West has been the cancellation of all things Russian. If the Russian is dead, they're simply dropped from programs. If they're alive, they're pressured to denounce Vladimir Putin's war, regardless of how dangerous that could be for them and their families back in Russia. To give just a few examples, Canada cancelled concerts by the 20-year-old pianist Alexander Malofiev in the Netherlands and Belgium and Italy. Performances featuring Tchaikovsky and Stravinsky were axed. The International Paralympic Committee barred Russian and Belarusian athletes from joining the Games in Beijing. And the name of the first person in space, Yuri Gagarin, was removed from a Space Foundation fundraiser. On smaller scales, academics are being uninvited, vandals have attacked Slavic groceries, and restaurants have lost their customers. What should we take from all of this? Here to discuss exactly that question is the perfect guest. Gary Saul Morrison is a professor of Slavic languages and literatures at Northwestern University. He's also the co-author of a recent book, Minds Wide Shut, How the New Fundamentalisms Divide Us. Gary, welcome. Thanks for having me. So, Pleasure to be. Gary, you are an expert in Russian literature and thought, and you wrote a lot about essentially cancel culture in your recent book. What was your gut reaction when you started to see the cancellations of all things Russian? You know, I, I suppose it should have been expected because you know, the way cancel culture works is that there are good guys and bad guys, and you know, there is no gray area. Everything's on even remotely associated with the bad guys becomes bad. And so you just apply it to a new topic, the, the Russians, which struck me because, you know, I started studying Russian during the height of the Cold War when, you know, the Soviets were a, a imminent threat. And nobody tried to cancel Russian culture. And on the contrary, they that's when it started in America. That's when they started, you know, teaching Russian in high schools and, and giving Russian classes in college. The complete opposite reaction. But then they didn't have a cancel culture back then. What does that indicate to you? It's a very interesting observation. Well, you know, it indicates that the division of the world into good and bad, where anything on the good side is justified regardless, and anything on the bad side must be awful, no matter how remote, uh, is a morally simplistic and very dangerous way to think. It is what produces ethnic hatred to begin with um, and, and other kinds of hatred. And so, you know, it, this should be a warning sign to us. When you start thinking that, you know, because President Putin, you know, does horrible things in Ukraine, we have to stop listening to Tchaikovsky. It, 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 you you want to stay back and say, what, what's going on here? How far can such thinking go? You, you wrote in a recent article um, the idea, maybe I'm extrapolating just a little, but for you as a red flag when you hear people saying things like there's moral clarity about right and wrong in this war. Can you explain why you find that particularly problematic? When you start thinking of, in terms of moral clarity, there are no limits. That is, that's when, you know, okay, if, you know, this is associated with, as you mentioned, you know, the Russian government, if there are any live Russians like that pianist, well, that they have to be bad. And well, if it's the pianist, then how about the music the pianist plays? And how about the, you know, the, all the dead Russians? As if somehow, you know, Tchaikovsky and Pushkin are to blame for Putin. Moral, the feeling of moral clarity 
licenses people to think that there are no limits and that the more extravagant they are, the more moral they are. That's the problem with that kind of thinking. Um, you can certainly take one side or the other, uh, I certainly do, without having to think in that particular way. And the ultimate irony here is that this kind of thinking is all too familiar with for you, who have studied Soviet Russia. Well, yes. I mean, it, to me, it's reminiscence of exactly how the Soviets thought. I mean, they certainly divided the world into, you know, all good and all bad. And so, you know, literally anything you did, you know, uh, that hurt your enemy was good. And, you know, that, that was the, the basis of their morality. And, you know, it is what led to the horrors of, uh, you know, of Soviet behavior to you know, killing in millions of people. Uh, I suspect that, you know, the people who did the Rwandan genocide were also thinking that, you know, everything good was on one side, everything bad was on the other. But, you know, um, you know the writer Solzhenitsyn has a, a famous line where he says, the line between good and evil runs through every human heart. We have to recognize each person's own capacity for it. And we're never so prone to doing evil as when we are convinced that we are completely morally pure. Obviously, for anyone in Ukraine or fleeing Ukraine, February 24th marked a cataclysmic shift away from normal life. Over 3.6 million people are now international refugees. And according to the International Organization for Migration, another six and a half million are displaced inside their own country. But part of the untold story about this war is how quickly and fundamentally life has changed for everyday Russians too. It's not an easy perspective to get in the current climate, which is why we invited our next guest. Joining us to help us understand what has changed in Russia is Konstantin Sonin, a professor of political economy at the University of Chicago's Harris School of Public Policy. He is Russian and was actually living in Moscow on a sabbatical year when the Kremlin launched the invasion. Konstantin, I really appreciate you joining us today. Hello. So let's go back to February 24th. You're in Russia. How did you learn about the invasion and what immediately happened? Okay, I, I, I was expecting the invasion, so it looked like that there will be invasion in the next coming of, uh, next um, couple of days. So I was checking the news every day when I woke up. So I woke up and saw that the invasion is ongoing. And so what did you think? How soon did you leave Russia? Why did you leave Russia? What changed? Okay, I, first I decided uh, I decided to stay because it was not clear how 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 bad the situation will will develop but it became very clear that the resistance of the Ukrainian army is very stiff and the Russian army doesn't make a lot of progress and then uh, because of the war protests and because people in Russia were many people were deeply unhappy they started to crack down on opposition they closed down first the media I, I, I was writing a column, Echo Moscow was closed, then an independent TV channel was closed. I went there on the day it was closed, then they blocked Facebook, and I decided that it's time to leave. And after that, they actually criminalized not only what I was posting on my social media, but they criminalized past postings. So you could go get in jail, and people are actually being prosecuted in Russia right now for something that they've written um, a year ago, even five years ago, uh, because now it's considered criminal. So right now, if you went back to Russia today, you would be arrested? Okay, uh, maybe not outright, but if I write something that I was writing on Facebook against the war when I was in Russia, yes, I will probably first find then arrested. How quickly did all of that happen? I mean, the things were developing uh, in the wrong direction for a couple of years right now in Russia, but of course they were developing pretty fast since the start of the war. And for everyday Russians who aren't writing blog posts against the war or anything like that, how has life changed for them? Okay, I think now a lot of people notice that the life changed because the inflation started to pick up, the prices went, went up, the exchange 
and the exchange rate of the ruble um, dropped down and uh, the government uh, basically frozen the currency accounts.